Our sermon text this morning is Psalm 62. These are the words of God. To the chief musician, to Jedithan, a psalm of David. Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will ye imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you. As a bowing wall ye shall be, as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. Selah. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense, I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us, Selah. Surely men of low degree are vanity and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression. And become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart upon them. God hath spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongest mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you have by it revealed yourself to us for our joy and for our instruction. I pray that you would comfort us and correct us by your word this morning. May we be uh, faithful and humble before it. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Be seated. One of the enduring benefits of the Psalms and the Psalter as a whole is the way that they capture the range of human emotion. So that they do many things, the Psalms do many things. They teach us to pray, they teach us how to understand God, They teach us how to understand the Christian life, but they also serve as models for how we ought to conduct ourselves emotionally and spiritually in the fight that is the Christian life. For the Christian life is is struggle. Paul exhorts us to to put on the armor of God that we may be uh, faithful soldiers of Jesus Christ. Uh, And this is a metaphor that is nonetheless instructive for us. And just as in, in a physical war, there's many different ways, many different uh, places that, that a soldier can find himself called to serve, so also in the warfare of souls, there are many different places, many different modes that a, that a Christian can find him or herself called to serve. And it can look very different from, from day to day. Some days it's, it's in the trenches for you, and you're, you're holding fast, and you're, you're doing the slow steady work of advancing the kingdom one muddy yard at a time. And some days it's it's wild and and terrifying grappling with the world, the flesh, and the devil. Some days you're you're a merry band of outlaws conducting raids on the enemy. And some days you're you're a lone commando really hoping that you're walking the right way. And some days the shell lands next to you and your world goes up in in a blast of of terror and, and pain. And in all of these, in each and every one, the question that you're confronted with is is the same. It's the same question. What can I trust in? What star do I navigate by? What rock can I ground my soul onto? And what we see in Psalm 62 is, is three different snapshots of a Christian in three different stages of the conflict. And we see him ask and answer that question in each case. What can I trust in? How, how do I ground myself? And ultimately, his answer is this, again and again, uh, in the Lord and in the Lord alone is your soul secure. So let's look at the text. Uh, the psalm is addressed to the chief musician and then to Jedithan, a psalm of David. It's worth pointing out that those, those titles are in the inspired text. They're not added by, by Bible translators. They're, well, they are in, translated, but they're, they're, they're part of the original inspired word, so they're for our instruction, uh, even if they are hard to understand. Uh, so what do we understand from it? Well, this is a psalm of David. This is written uh, by a man who knew struggle 
and pain and adversity, and who also knew in his bones what it means to trust the Lord. This is not the song of an armchair theologian contemplating with his pipe esoteric theology, nor is it a, 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 a pretty boy songwriter, right, just kind of making a jazzy tune. Rather, this is the work of a slayer of giants, an outlaw, a king and a warrior, who, according to his own testimony, once grabbed a bear by the beard and killed it. Which, the more you think about that, the stranger that is. Right? I don't know about you, but I've never looked at a bear and thought, ah, yes, one of my options here is to grab him by the beard and kill him. Right? <laughs> Maybe I'm the only one who has not considered that. So, so David knew the fight, in other words. Now, second, uh, this is addressed uh, to the chief musician. So this, this was intended uh, to be incorporated into the musical worship of Israel. Right? This is not just, I mean, it might have been just like a birthday present for the chief musician, but I find that unlikely. It was probably David writing a piece for then the worship of Israel. It's also uh, to Jedithan, um, which in the first service I didn't know what that meant, but Aaron has enlightened me, enlightened me since then. Uh, so Jedithan actually was an individual. Uh, he was one of the uh, Levites whom David put uh, and, and gave, a, gave a, t a role in the musical leadership of Israel. Uh, so to say to Jedithan, again, we, we don't know entirely what it means specifically. Probably it was either for him to play or maybe, you know, play this like Jedithan would play it, right? Or maybe it was a particular tune. We're not sure, but there is another psalm with the same title. Uh, it's psalm 39. And if you look at the two of them, they're very similar. Uh, they both seem to be written in a similar mode for a similar audience. And so it seems like maybe this was a, a, uh, a liturgical uh, instruction. Hey, use this in this part of the service, right? Because it captures this, this element. Um, so regardless, we can use the, the parallels between the two, the two texts to inform one another. Uh, structurally, the, the psalm is divided up into three sections, helpfully for us by, by the selahs, right? So you look and you see in, in verse 4, uh, it ends with, with the selah, there, there's some sort of break, and then in verse 8, also a selah. Uh, and in each of these, the tone is very different. And so I think it's appropriate, it's fitting to take them as three distinct sections, three distinct units either tracing out a progression, like we begin in one, we move to two, and we, we finish in three, or else simply just three different moments, three different, it's capturing three different exhortations uh, for the Christian's life. Um, so we'll look at each of them in, in turn, and then talk about the psalm as a whole, and then look at them in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the first, the first section, verses one through four, uh, this is the Christian in, in crisis. Uh, why so? Well, he begins, truly my soul waiteth upon God, right? He's, he's affirming his, his position before God. Um, but also, look at verse 3, right? He, he breaks suddenly, God is my refuge and strength, and then he goes, how long will you imagine mischief against a man? You're, go you're going down, you're a tottering wall. Who's he talking to? It seems like a, a sharp break. It seems like this is a man surrounded by his enemies. He's, he's hemmed in. Behind and before. He's holding on to hope steadfastly, but it's, it's hard. He feels keenly the tempter's pull. And, and he has to remind himself in verse 4 that, that the tempter's a liar, that, that his enemies are, are illusor, illusory. Right? You look at verse 4, they only consult to cast him down. They, they delight in lies. They bless with their mouths, but they curse inwardly. Uh, he has to remind himself the tempter is a liar. So this is, this is the, the picture of, of a man alone, but he's trusting in God alone. And the second stanza, uh, verses 5 through 8, uh, this is different. This is the Christian preparing for trouble. Uh, notice that the wild, desperate tone is gone. He, he's more measured. He's more earnest. He's giving exhortation to his own soul and to those with him. Notice uh, there's, there's strong similarities between the first two. Verses 1 and 2 are almost repeated in verses 5 and 6. They're, they're almost identical. There's a couple of differences, though. Uh, verse 5 is, is an imperative. 
It's saying, soul, trust in the Lord, as opposed to verse 1 that says, truly my soul trusts in the Lord. So it's, it's a, an exhortation to himself. And then also, uh, verses 2 and 6, he only is my rock and my salvation, he is my defense, I shall not be greatly moved. And then verse 6, they are identical except for one word, and that word is greatly. We'll, we'll talk more about this later, but, but this, this captures the, the Christian who's not currently facing trouble, and so he's able to be more measured, more, more confident. In verse 2, he says, I will not be moved greatly. I might be moved a little, but I'm not going to be greatly moved. And then in verse, in verse 5, he says, I will not be moved. So there seems to be greater uh, uh, peace and, and sobriety of mind in, in the second section here. Um, so he, he's confident, and he's trying to remind himself in the light what he will be tempted to forget in the dark. Right? Also in this, in this stanza, he's not alone. We see in verse, in verse 1, no mess, no, no men, or, or for the first stanza, no mention of anyone else except for his enemies. Right? He seems to be, all, the only one he's talking to is, is the bad guys. But in the second stanza, verse 8, he then turns and addresses those with him. O ye people, right? pour out your heart before the Lord. He, he tells them, uh, he, he exhorts them to be conditioned by trust in the Lord. And then what does that trust look like? Well, to come before him with, his, with, with their thanksgivings and their petitions continually, right? It, you know, at, at all times, trust in him at all times, over and over. Uh, this, this is an invitation from the word of God for us to cast our cares upon the Lord, right? So, so God is telling us to pour out our hearts before him. And, and pouring out your heart is a strong and, and striking metaphor, right? Take, take whatever's pooled up in your heart. Take the, the sludge of worry and fear and doubt that, that's pooled up in there and scoop it out and dump it before his throne. It's really actually an astounding invitation. The Lord would ask, would, would require us to do that. The third stanza, the third section, uh, verses 9 through 12, is the Christian now looking at, at the world around him. He is, uh, it, it doesn't have nearly the same urgency in this section as, as it did He's warning and concerned about bigger but less immediate temptations, things that are further out. Here, David compares, right, to, to, to the hearer, compares the rock that is God to, to man who is breath, vanity. Vanity literally meaning breath. Uh, and he gives sober theological counsel to Christians who are called to remain steadfast in a tumultuous world. So three distinct pictures, each of them corresponding to different places the Christian might find themselves, either in life or, or in the course of one week. So what we'll, what we'll do now with, with the rest of our time this morning is to look at first some, some overarching aspects of the psalm and then dive into each of these snapshots, each of these, these vignettes, and consider a particular application for these parts of the fight. Something in, in the text that is difficult to see in the English, although it is there, but right on the surface in the Hebrew is, is the repetition of a certain word, uh, and the word is only. You see that in verses 2, in, uh, verse two particularly, he only is my rock, right? Uh, verse uh, 5, my soul wait thou only upon the Lord. 6, he only is my rock, right? Um, but it's also in verse 1 that truly is, is a translation of that same word. It actually is the beginning word of half the verses. So half the verses begin with this word only, only, only. And it's actually used somewhat ambiguously uh, which to, to bring out a contrast. Uh, verses 1 and 2 and 5 and 6 all affirm David's reliance on God only, right? The use of the word there is is. God only is my rest. He only is my, is my trust, right? And then for, uh, verses 4 and 9 also use the word, but they use it to highlight the vanity of the wicked. So there's a contrast, and it's potent. So w when you're looking around for places to, to moor your soul, 
when you're trying to pick out what to trust in the midst of the hurly-burly of life, you know, your options are, are God, the only rock, or you have man and the things of men which are only a breath, right? only God or that which is only vanity. So there, there's a, a, a contrast there. It's challenging at times to remember that there is only one true anchor for your heart, for your soul, for your, for your being, uh, that, that everything else at the end of the day is, is swirling seaweed. Uh, it's difficult to remember that often because we are blessed with peace and prosperity. Uh, when, when things are good, we don't often feel the need for that rock beneath us. When, when the marriage is, is fairly peaceful and the kids have been docile, at least for the last couple of days, and there's been no particular snarls at work, and the weather is good and you're in moderately good health, uh, it's easy to, to rest on those circumstantial things, right? To, to forget that need for something grounding you. When there are no rains or floods or winds, even a foundation of sand looks pretty good. Right? Oh, seems to work fine. When the waves are small, seaweed can seem like a pretty good anchor. What does it matter? Uh, but it's not, and you will drift. So in the good times, the discipline for you is the discipline to keep on coming back, to keep on reminding yourself of your position before God, of your need for your God. In some ways, when things are hard, it's actually easier to remember your God. So in that way, trials are a blessing. And I'm sure you've experienced this. Pain, uh, physical, emotional, whatever, can focus your attention uh, very effectively. Uh, when, when the child is, is persistently disrespectful, you're confronted with your need for wisdom and patience and strength and resolve much more specifically and potently. This reminds you of your maker. Right? You come to the end of your patience very quickly. Right? When, uh, when, when God take things, takes things away, you're forced to stare in the face, well, apparently that wasn't the source of my happiness or else I'm very sad now, right? It, well, what are my options? <laughs> so that thing that I really liked is apparently not the thing that I need if I am to believe the scriptures. You're, you're keenly aware in those times of your need for something outside yourself. Uh, but... When times are hard, you're then vulnerable to different temptations. You're keenly aware of your need for a rock, for an anchor, but in the swirling waves, it can be difficult to see anything actually clearly. And so you can, you can end up falling prey to one of, one of two things. One, you can end up latching onto something that feels solid but isn't. So you can... You can, in, in hurt and in, in difficulty and in, in the swirling waves, you can grab onto something, right, perhaps reflexively, and then put your hope and your trust, even just your time, your attention, your solace, your comfort in that, as opposed to in your God. This is, this is one problem that, that besets us. A hurting and desperate people can easily be drawn to false gods. And that's been true forever. And that can look a bunch of different ways. Perhaps it's something relatively healthy, right? Diet and exercise or a different religious setting. Or maybe it's something kind of neutral, like fishing or model trains or, or a hobby or something, right? Uh, something that you give your time, your, your attention, and that you gain solace from when things are hard. Or perhaps it's something downright wicked, like Buddhism or drunkenness, right? Regardless of, of what the particular thing is, if we are turning in pain and in sorrow, if we are turning to something that is other than the triune God, it will end in despair. And so that is a temptation. The temptation in good times is to forget your need for God, and the temptation in hard times is to latch on to something that's not God. Then there's the other, the other problem, the other temptation we can, we can fall into in hard times, uh, which is despair, right? There's nothing solid. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to sort of drift. Uh, maybe you're, you're tired of looking for an anchor, so you give up. Why, why fight against the waves? Let them push me where they will. What does it matter? Needless to say, this is not the path to happiness either. But in each case, always and forever, 
the answer is the same. Trust in the Lord alone. You might say, okay, gee, thanks, wonderful, got that. How do I do that? What does that look like? What, what, where, does that, where does that touch down? How do I, how do I trust the Lord on a, on a day-to-day basis? One way is to do what you're doing right now, to faithfully come to the Lord's day worship. Trust is, is not simply something we do with our, with our minds, something we do with our, with our hearts. It's also an act of our, of our bodies. So, right, so how do we trust the Lord? One of the ways we trust the Lord is by putting on our shoes on Sunday morning and getting the kids into the car seats and driving to church and walking upstairs and sitting yourselves down and standing and kneeling and raising hands and receiving from the, the Lord's Supper. Right? In season and out of season, do that. Come, come to the presence of Almighty God through thick and thin, through happy and sad. This is, this is a manifest act of trust. It seems like something we just do out of habit. But when you come to the Lord's day, worship. And you come and you sit and you hear his word and you worship him. You are saying with voice and with body and soul, you are God and I am not. Feed me. Here I am. And then you receive from him assurance and comfort and instruction and blessing. So one of the ways that you ground your soul is by coming to church. Do so. And then second, you, we also come to God in his word. When you are, when you are reading, reading the word, sure, you can do so simply out of habit. But when you are, when you are picking, up, picking up the word of God and reading it, you are saying, again, potently, you are God and I am not. Feed me. Teach me. Right? I'm, I'm relying upon you and not upon my own wisdom. So, so do so. Come to his word. Do so when, when the battle is quiet and when it rages. Sometimes coming to the word is like stockpiling weapons and polishing them and making sure they're all arranged just so. You're thinking, well, I don't know when I'm going to need those, but, well, there they are. And that's wonderful. And sometimes it's more like dodging behind the, the crenellation of the wall after you've shot your last arrow and finding another one on the floor, right? Exactly what I need, just right here, right now. Sometimes you wrestle with God, and sometimes you calmly think about his kindness. But regardless, by coming to him in his word, by submitting yourself to it, you are anchoring yourself to him either during storm or in preparation for storm. Now let's look at the, the different sections in a little bit more detail. Uh, so the first is the Christian in, in crisis. Uh, this is when, when you're cornered and beset, when you're being pounded. And again, th this can look a, a thousand different ways. It can... Uh, be external persecution, right, where some sort of tyrannical power is imposing things upon you, um, restricting, you know, what you can do, what you can say, and then jailing you and whatnot. And uh, this is not something we are likely to face right at this moment, but it's getting likelier by the day. So uh, considering it as a live option is probably healthy. Uh, perhaps it's not external persecution from some tyrannical power, but perhaps it's the pressure of weariness, right? When you feel like you're getting up tired, every day, and that you're, you come to the end of your patience by about 11 a.m., right? and then you're beset all day by the, by the weariness of the task. Or, or maybe the pressure is, is temptation, that you are being actively, actively attacked by, by the temptations of, of your own heart, your, your desires, the world, the flesh, and the devil, right? Lust or envy or, or discontent or resentment or despair. Regardless, Sometimes you're surrounded by enemies. And in such times, David's example is much needed. What does he do? Well, he hurls all the defiance he can at his enemies, and then he clings as hard as he can to the rock of God Almighty. He commits his soul to God in quietness. The, uh, the word, uh, truly my soul waits, the, the waiting aspect communicates quietness. He says, I, I, things, are, things are terrifying around me, but, but my soul is quiet. And he, has, he reaffirms the confident hope that God will deliver. 
But there's also a terribly and delightfully human element in his words. Uh, we, we addressed it briefly, um, but let's, let's look at it again. Uh, verse 2, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved, right? I will not be moved much, right? But I could imagine being moved a little bit <laughs> because I'm being moved a little bit now, right? You could imagine him, him on, on a rock, right, being buffeted around. It's like, well, I'm not going to say that I'm not going to be moved because I'm being moved, but I'm not going to be greatly moved. I won't be knocked off this rock. And so the fact that I, I feel the, the, the buffeting, I feel the, that I'm being pounded, doesn't mean that I'm going to be totally cast down, right? Again, cast down but not destroyed, persecuted but not abandoned. So this is, this is David's faith, but it is a, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief sort of faith. It's, it's faith the size of a mustard seed. It's a, I'm not exactly sure how this is all going to work out, and I'm starting to think that it might be hard and painful, but I know that the Lord will provide deliverance. I, I feel the, the pounding, but I know the Lord will provide deliverance. I shall not be greatly moved. And then he turns, and he addresses his enemies. And this is instructive for us as well. Often, we, uh, when, when we are tempted or when we are beaten down, we, we try to ignore the things that are, that are tempting our souls. And that's not what David does. He, he stares them right in the face, and he hurls taunts back at them. Right? He said, how long will you imagine mischief against a man? Ye shall be slain, all of you. And then he says, a, a bowing wall shall ye be, and a tottering fence, which is, I don't know, a little bit of an odd insult to, to throw back at someone. Why, why that, you know, you tottering fence? I don't know. But, but if you look, these are both defensive structures. Right? A tottering wall, or a wall and a fence are, are defensive. Well, David is currently sure seeming to be on the defensive. He's the one being pounded. Why is he calling out the defenses of his enemies? He's doing so by faith. He is finding refuge in God and then confidently asserting that the fight is going to be taken back to the devils before too long. And their stronghold is made of cardboard. So he looks his tempters in the eye and he says, I see you. You're imagining mischief against me, but your days are numbered. You can do your worst. But you won't shake me much, for I'm held fast by my God. And you are to do likewise. In the midst of the hurly-burly, hold fast to the hope that is yours in Christ Jesus. Even, because even if it doesn't feel like it in the moment, even if it feels like you're getting pounded, you are still part of a victorious march. Your captain is moving against the gates of hell, and they will fall like tissue paper before him. And also recognize that the tempters give you nothing but lies. Right? They tell you one thing, and they mean another. They promise pleasure or glory or, or uh, recognition. They promise that, that you, can, you can have the world on your own terms, right? That you're not beholden to anyone else, right? That's, that's often the temptation. That's often the lie that's, that's given to us in temptation. Like, I can be selfish right now because I'm not really, God didn't really make me. God didn't really put me where I am. I'm actually just my own, and so I'm just going to sit here and eat the donut. Right? That's, and I'm not going to be beholden to anyone else. I have the world on my terms. Uh, but, but that's a lie. It's illusion. It's not the world as it really is. But worse than a lie, sometimes it's a partial truth. They promise pleasure or recognition or, or, or fame, and then you will. You'll have fleeting pleasure followed by aching misery. So do not believe them. And when your own heart's desires seek to corrupt you or pull you to despair, reject them and turn to Christ. The second, sec second, second section uh, is the Christian, not so much in the hurly-burly, not so much in, in the fight, uh, but in preparation. The only way to be able to offer that sort of resistance to persecution, to temptation, is if you've prepared beforehand, in advance. Uh, one of Aesop's fables uh, tells a story about a, a boar sharpening his tusks against a tree. And the fox comes by and says, 
a pleasant day. Why are you doing that? Right? Uh, seems odd. And the bull responds that when the hunters and dogs come, there'll be no time for sharpening then. Right? And the, the same is true for us. The way we persevere in times of trial is by disciplining ourselves and building habits of godliness in times of peace. So, David in this passage gives himself instructions. He talks to himself. He tells his soul what to do. Verse 5, my soul, wait thou upon the Lord. Wait upon God, for my expectation is from him. Uh, A wonderful pastor and theologian of the last century said, a lot of our problems come from listening to ourselves as opposed to talking to ourselves, right? We don't tell ourselves what to do. David gives us an example. He tells himself what to do. Wait my soul upon the Lord. Trust upon him and do so only. Also, the repetition in the psalm is interesting. He, the, the first two verses and, and verses five and six are almost the same, right? Why the repetition? This is also for our instruction. We need to hear things again and again and again. That's the way of it. Uh, and Paul says this to the Philippians, right? He writes to them, I know I'm writing you the same things again. It's no trouble for me, and it's good for you. It's good for you to hear things again and again and again. Uh, that's, that's something that I've come to understand better and better as time has gone on. Boy, I, I need to hear the same things over and over again because I'm forgetful. In a way, if you think about it, there's only one sermon, right? Christ crucified on your behalf. There's only, there's only one sermon. We repeat it over and over and over again in slightly different ways. And you need to hear it. I need to hear it. We all need to hear it again and again and again. So David says, again, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. So come to the scriptures each day. Pray for eyes to see. Pray for ears to hear. You're storing up for the day of trouble, as well as strengthening your hands for the current day's battles. There's also the interplay there between the corporate and the individual that's worth noting. In verse 5, he says, my soul, hey you, soul, you know, trust in the Lord. And then in verse 8, He pivots, and he says to those around him, trust all ye peoples at all times in the Lord. He exhorts his brothers and sisters. Uh, Don't forget uh, that the Christian life, again, like any war or any fight, consists both of personal duties, personal trials, and also of fellowship with those doing the same. We are both engaged in our own personal holiness and part of a band, part of a group part of a people, a body. So the more, and also the more seriously we, we, we take and we understand our own duties, the more precious will be our communion. The more potent the encouragement we can give one another. This is one of the things that we do on Sunday morning when we gather together, is we encourage one another. Some of the songs we sing are addressed to God, some of the songs we sing are addressed to our own souls, and some of them are addressed to each other. And that's right and good following the example of the psalmist. So, as you come together, remember that you are not an individual. Well, you are, with an individual soul before God and also part of a body, part of a group. The encouragement David gives to the people, right, what does he say? He says, trust him at all times, pour out your heart before him, as we looked at earlier. Take refuge in his care for us and pour out your heart, which, which is striking, No matter what fills your heart, take it before the throne of grace. What is it? Doesn't matter. Pour it. He he doesn't say, right, pour out, you know, the reasonable and appropriate things before God. He says, pour out your hearts. So take take it before the throne of grace. You use the language of scripture to do so. Uh, You may find as you as you do so that that what fills your heart is petty or bitter or shallow or vain. And this is one of the ways that the Lord sanctifies us. He searches our hearts. He shows that we are immature. Sometimes in our prayers, you're praying for something, you're like, oh, that's a very petty thing to ask for, Lord. Now I realize, now that I'm saying it aloud before you, Lord, help me to grow. (laughs) Right? And that's that's right. There's sometimes when making the complaint is its own answer. So pray that the Lord would reveal your selfishness and your vanity. Do so. Why? Why? Well, the alternative is is to go into battle unprepared, trusting in yourself or trusting in false gods. 
Christ says in the Gospels that he is gentle and lowly in heart, that, that he doesn't snuff out a smoldering wick or he doesn't break a bruised reed. So take comfort. God knows your frame. He remembers that you are but dust. So bring to him your fears and doubts and worries and then bear them no longer. And this is the habit that will prepare you for trials. And if you're beset by trials already, all the more reason, all the more reason to bring the things that are besetting you to God, knowing that he cares for you. The final section uh, in the psalm uh, represents a more removed, a more sober analysis, right? It's more like we're on the hill, we're looking out at the battle, as opposed to we're in the camp and they're coming any minute. Uh, this is looking at not so much the right now fears, but more like the what's on the horizon, what's, what's looming. And this is, this is a helpful and instructive for two reasons. Uh, first of all, there, there's always looming dangers. There's always big, scary things happening on the horizon, right? That Christ says, wars and rumors of wars, there's always going to be, right? Uh, there, there's always bad guys out there doing bad things. Uh, but, but also, I think this is helpful because there's a type of person uh, who's not so much troubled by the day-to-day -day difficulties, but who is driven batty by what the bad guys in Washington, D.C. are doing. His work and his family are fairly stable, but he spends hours poring over political news sites, fretting about what the bad guys are doing. And because this anxiety is about something further away, it's easier to mask it as, as prudence or practicality, uh, but it's anxiety just the same. And so David's words are both comfort and also correction. He continues, again, in this, in this stanza as in the others, the theme of the singular nature, the, the onlyness of God's power and being and authority. All men are vanity. All men are a breath, no matter who they are. All men are sons of Adam, and as such, they're like grass that withers. All men, regardless of their place or position in life, are fleeting, and their self-glorying will be stripped away. All the great ones of the earth, all the children of men, they're just dust and vanity, breath. God alone is worthy of your reverence and your worship. So obey him. We live in times when it is, is easy to get jumpy. It feels sometimes like we're living on a powder keg. And, and any little thing could be, be the spark that makes it all go up. And it's easy to see headlines that talk about this or that rich and powerful entity grabbing more power. And it's easy to feel the temptation to panic and head for the hills. Maybe you're already in the hills. Head into higher hills, right? Yeah. You're like, oh, you know, what? Why is, why is Bill Gates buying up all that farmland anyways? Or what does Google do with all the information they have? Or how are the bad guys going to use the, the new AI innovations? And sure, th there are practical considerations that are, that are worthwhile. But we live in a, in a time of excessive nervousness and a profound lack of courage. And consequently, the church needs to boldly say with David, in Psalm 62, that power belongs to the Lord alone. There is no other rock. And right now we see the Lord shaking things up so that that which cannot be shaken will remain. So anchor yourself to the rock that is Christ and let the nations rage. In the final verse of the psalm, we find a statement of one of the, one of the profound mysteries of the Christian faith. He says in verse 12, uh, Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy... For thou renderest to every man according to his work. Okay. The Lord is merciful. Got it. The Lord gives to everyone what they deserve. Those do not seem to be the same. In fact, those seem to be contradictory. So what are they both doing here? This seems to be more warning than comfort. And, and you, could, you could take it that way and, and have that be your interpretation. You say, yes, the Lord is merciful to me, and he's going to judge you according to your works, bad guys, right? That, that's, that's plausible, absolutely. But it seems like there's deeper and more profound comfort for us here. He says, to the Lord belongs mercy, and he gives to every man according to his work. So what does it mean for us to be given to according to our work? Well, it's easy for me to think, like, well, that doesn't sound like good news. Right? That sounds really bad, like I'm going to get what I deserve, which is not good. But this, I think, misses 
misses the, 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 deeper, the deeper things. That, that we are the workmanship of God created for good works. So by his great power, because all power belongs to God, he has taken us who are not worthy in ourselves and he has then set us in his people. He's made us part of his people and then given us good works to do that matter, right? And I think that's what it's getting at here. Because you are merciful, Lord, the works that I can do for your kingdom are worthy of reward. Because he began a good work, he will bring it forward to completion. And part of the completion of that good work is not just us being zapped to glory, but us laboring in meaningful ways for his kingdom. And this, is, this is comfort. It's also warning. But the well done, good and faithful servant that we are promised, if we are faithful, well, it is guaranteed by God's faithfulness, and it's not a participation trophy, but it is true and meaningful reward, that the Lord does reward to every man according to his work. So though there's nothing good in us, yet we are, we are bound to the God of glory, and he has made us his through the death of Christ in our stead. He alone is worthy of, of worship and reverence, and because of his great and unspeakable power, he has made it such that your small victories in his service will be rewarded in the last day. So let us hold fast to Christ and strive mightily in small and daily faithfulness through thick and thin, knowing that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are our rock and our defense and our deliverance, our glory and our salvation. Thank you that you are abundant in mercy and that you reward our faithfulness, even though our faithfulness is gift as well. We ask that you would strengthen our faith and make us courageous for the fight. To that end, we offer back to you the words our Lord taught us to pray, saying, In 1 Samuel 22, David, having fled from Saul yet again, uh, gathers together for the first time a small army. And you would think that he would recruit the uh, noblemen, the men of renown, the rich folks, the heavy hitters, right, into his army, but listen to what the scripture says. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them. In other words, David starts off his army with this tiny, ragtag group of only 400 men. But they don't stay poor. They don't stay distressed or rebels forever. These are the same men that go, that go on to be known as David's mighty men. And as we read this passage, knowing that David is a type of Jesus, that his life is foreshadowing the life of Jesus, we can see in this the way that Jesus, the son of David, operates. And he operates in the same way. I hate to break it to you, but you are the distressed. You are the poor, the discontented, the rebel, the outcast. Jesus has spread his table for the weary. He calls the poor and the unclean and offers to be their captain. But just like David, Jesus does not let those who come to him remain the way they are. He takes the sinner and he makes them holy. He wants to fill his ranks with rebels and turn them into mighty men who reign with him. Now imagine for just a, a quick second that you are in Israel at the time uh, David's setting up this army. And you see all the people uh, walking up to David's house, and frankly, they look like a dysfunctional and raggedy group. Would you be able to set aside your pride and publicly march with them? Would you be willing to associate yourself with such a crowd? If so, then come in faith and welcome the Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we are grateful for the very real yet mystical way in which you, through the person of the Holy Spirit, have incorporated us into yourself. We ask that you would further knit us together and into yourself through this glorious sacrament. Thank you for this bread and this wine, signs and seals of your favor. Nourish us by them yet again, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The charge is this. Do not grow weary of doing good. And remember that death and resurrection is the, is the pattern laid out for us by our master. So if 
The path he has set for us leads into the grave, metaphorically or, or literally. Know that he has walked that path before us, and it holds no terror for those who are in Christ. Now receive with believing hearts and open hands the benediction of your God. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen.